We have representatives here from Guidepost Solutions. Uh, one of them, Dan Verity, has joined us all the way over from the London office. And they're going to talk about why security is such a vital component to working internationally. We have Shane Campbell is a client executive, Patrick Markham, regional vice president, and Dan Verity, project manager. Morning. Um, Morning. Just trying to make sure everything works. <laughs> Got it. New tools, so I wanted to make sure I understood how the operation works. So first of all, thank you for allowing us to come and present to you. Uh, my name is Pat Markham. I'm the Regional Vice President for Guidepost Solutions here in Dallas. We are Guidepost Solutions is a security and technology consulting firm. Uh, we've worked with data center clients and corporate clients uh, here in Dallas for uh, approximately 20 years and have offices in uh, California, Texas, um, Chicago, New York, and down into Washington. Uh, we also have office in London, which falls under, my, uh, under, under me as well. Um, so I brought with me Dan Verity from our London office. He manages our London office. And Shane Campbell is our client executive for a large uh, data center client uh, that we work with globally. So we're here this morning to talk to you about uh, international data, sec uh, international security. Um, we've worked with clients, like I said, both here domestically in the United States and uh, taking them uh, around the world, helping them standardize their technology. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today are some of the challenges that we faced as we've taken our, our design model and taken it internationally. We're going to talk about some of the regional concerns that we've uncovered as we've worked around the globe, um, trying to implement standardization in, in markets that were quite unfamiliar to us at the time. Uh, we're going to identify some of the strategies that we've used to help implement uh, and overcome some of these challenges. And then finally, we're going to talk through how we've put together global security and global network operation centers so that the clients can then monitor all their facilities worldwide from regional uh, operation center locations. So we've obviously worked quite a bit in the United States on various types of, of facilities, including data centers. But as you can see, each of these dots kind of represents uh, the, the facilities that we've worked at globally. Um, we've worked in the South America, Europe, uh, Asia, and down into Australia. So we've, 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 done a lot of, we've done work in a lot of the markets that a lot of the questions are going to come up about. So now I'd like to introduce Shane, who's going to talk about some of the challenges that we've discovered as we've, we've worked through these markets. Thanks, Pat. Everybody hear me OK? Good. Thank you, everyone. I get, to, I get the privilege of sharing with you challenges that we've faced when doing international projects. Our first challenge. Uh, well, let me just back up a little bit. I actually um, had my first foray in doing international projects after 9-11. Um, we did some assessments uh, up, in, uh, up in Canada for uh, a, large, a large company in the US. And, um, and, then, and then we moved down into South America. And then I all of a sudden got, became the, the guy that does international projects. So it moved into Asia, and then it moved into Europe. So <clears throat> I'm pretty familiar with some of the challenges that we faced internationally, and, uh, and I will be explaining some of those today. Our first challenge is design team coordination. When you're working with a, uh, uh, another country, you may not be working with architects that are or with uh, uh, owners that are actually within your region. So you'll, you'll be dealing with, you could be dealing with foreign design teams. And how do we communicate uh, technical designs to foreign de design teams? Well, 
first you need to get to know your team. You're going to be spending a lot of time after hours with them. You have to accommodate the differences in time zones. You have to think about uh, country, other country holidays. Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> that's pretty important. Also, you need to know that security is no longer a fringe item. Get your consultant uh, involved early and often. They need to be involved in the master planning of these projects. They need to understand what the landscape is. They need to understand how they're going to be space planning these projects. Our second challenge is implementation team coordination. Understanding your milestone dates are critical. There's nothing worse than going to a site to commission test to find out that that country is on holiday. Uh, I have had the personal privilege of figuring that out myself. So understand the milestone dates and how that relates to that, that particular country. Uh, milestone dates would be for a data center. Uh, when is your primary point of presence room going to be on, ready? When is your main point of entry room going to be ready or IDF or whatever you call it? When are your network go live dates? Uh, when are you doing critical systems testing? Site data center turnover dates. Those are, those are very key when you're working uh, with a, another country in different time zones. You, all, you should ask yourself these questions. What security needs to be in place as these items come online? When you bring up the network, though there's already infrastructure in place. Should we be secu securing that? What if multi-data center construction happens in phases? What if they're building a building and they're only building a couple pods or a couple suites uh, for that building? How do you handle maintaining security for the, the site, that, the piece that's online versus the, the unconstructed piece or the piece that's going to have more construction on it? Frequent communication is essential. It's essential between the installer, the local project team, and the consultant. It's essential between the installer and the consultant. Uh, it's, it's, um, you need to be building those relationships because those guys are going to be the guys that are your eyes and ears on the ground. <clears throat> Our third challenge is equipment procurement. <clears throat> Chances are the, the same problems that you have or in the states with products will be the same problems that you have in another country. It'll just be expounded. It'll be bigger. So identify the troublesome products on, early on. Uh, pay attention to long lead items, biometrics, revolving doors, turnstiles, locking hardware. I'm sure many people in this room have problems with locking hardware. In the States, you're going to have the same problems in another country. Avoid uh, any products that are not off the shelf. Uh, in the US, we use a particular uh, uh, an alarm that uh, you can't get readily in other countries. So pay attention to that. Our first, fourth challenge is actually um, probably one of, the, one of the most important, quality control. Your, the company that you're working with that may be based out of the US is going to want the same quality that they have in this country as they do in another country. The way that we handle that is to perform detailed project review Project updates weekly are necessity. And it's, it's, it's updates between you or the consultant and the security contractor, updates with the, the consultant and the GC, meetings with the whole team. Just remember, you're going to be doing meetings outside of normal business hours uh, with, with these entities. Take lots of pictures, have them take pictures, send them to you. Um, track the project status via any means necessary. That's all I can say. And know your product. The, know you, the more you know your product and design, the better capable you are to give direction to the local team and provide accurate progress of the project implementation. Avoid any ambiguous design concepts. Uh, with our designs, we like to put in a responsibility matrix. Uh, we found that that helps bring clarity to who has ownership over, over what piece. Uh, the electrical contractor has the, the power, has the cabling, has the conduit. The security contractor has the terminations, the field devices they're installing. Also, 
think outside of the box. I had a client who uh, wanted to, or was building a large project in the Philippines, and he was concerned that they wouldn't have the same quality in the Philippines as they did here in the States. <clears throat> and so we said, okay, how can we, how can we help avoid inequality problems in, in the Philippines? Now, mind you, in the Philippines, in order to install a conduit in a concrete wall, they're taking a hammer and a nail and they're chipping out the concrete to put the conduit in the wall, okay? So those are the kind of things that you, that you, you might be dealing with. So we said, we kind of brainstormed a bit and said, okay, what can we do to help minimize the problems? Well, we came up with having a local security contractor build panels, put terminal blocks in the panels, terminate to those terminal blocks, then we had them do an instructional DVD, create uh, an actual instruction worksheet so that the security contractor that was in the Philippines, all they had to do was get the conduit, get the cable, and terminate using the DVD and the instructions uh, to the panels and mount the panels on the wall so that their panels look the same in the Philippines as they did in the U.S. By the way, that was a very successful project. Local codes having authority of jurisdiction is our uh, next <clears throat> challenge. I can tell you right off the bat, no one knows all the codes for every country, for every state, for every county, for every city. It's just not possible. So what do you do? You have to make sure to have a localization process in place. You need to work with the local teams to understand what the requirements are. And one of the ways that we try to overcome this hurdle is to uh, design with fell secure in mind, meaning our doors lock if there's a fire, they can't get in, or if power goes out, they can't get in, but yet have safety in mind so that they can freely egress out. Sixth, my last, last one, and it is, it is extremely important because, for instance, for me, English is not the same as English for my friend over here. He speaks the Queen English and I don't, and there is a difference. Communication is already difficult bringing technology in the mix. It can compound it big time. An example I have is when I was doing some work in South America early on, I had all the stakeholders in the meeting. I was down there trying to show them how am I going to implement, how am I going to implement this project? So I had the architect, the owner, the GC, uh, you name it, they're all in the room. I spent 20 minutes on a whiteboard going through, this is how we're going to get security accomplished. 20 minutes in, the owner raises his hand and he says, and I'm going to do my best Portuguese here, Senor Chena, no one here understands what you're saying. <laughs> I realized at that moment, I have a communication problem. <laughs> Here's what I found. I was speaking too fast. I was using a lot of slang. And I was using a lot of abbreviations. And they didn't understand any of that. So uh, as you're doing projects in the global market, I would just say, slow down, avoid slang, and avoid abbreviations. And I will turn it over to Dan now. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, well, good morning. I just want to say a quick thank you for having me over in Dallas. Uh, it's amazing I actually got here, considering I drove on the wrong side of the road the entire way, but hey. <laughs> Um, like I say, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Dan Verity. Uh, as Pat mentioned, I look after things in Guideposts London office. Uh, I've been in the business for around 12, 13 years. And in my time at Guidepost, I've been pretty lucky. I've been able to work in uh, Europe, throughout Europe, um, over into Asia and also into Australia. So I've gained a lot of experience. Um, I'm hoping to share some of that with you today and talk about some of the challenges that I face when I'm dealing with security and considering it internationally. I'm going to start with the point at the top, which um, may be obvious, but um, 
as far as we see it, data center managers see security at the top of the list when it comes to operating a data center. Um, it's obvious to see why uh, there's um, no real way to um, really do things without good security in place. And in my experience, our uh, international customers are becoming more and more aware um, of some of the risks around bad security planning. Um, they're beginning to see security from a global perspective. Um, for example, how might events in another part of the world affect me and my operation here? So for us as security design people, that presents some pretty interesting challenges. How do you demonstrate that your designs are of an appropriate standard or what considerations have taken place with respect to your surroundings or that specific part of the world? And our experience also tells us that our customers feel more comfortable when we provide local expertise. Uh, somebody who understands that region or that market um, and somebody who's maybe lived or experienced some of the cultural aspects that might affect the way that you consider security. And just touching on something Shane said earlier, and you'll understand, I'm sure, that um, nobody can predict every threat or every risk in every country at any given time. Um, it's, it's impossible to do that, but there are some things that we can do um, on the ground to try and make things easier. And we can do threat assessments. Uh, we can do trend analysis, and this is something that we've started doing quite recently. And that could be collating every RFI or every question that we've received in, say, the last 18 months stacking them up by region and saying, how many times has this come up? This might be a good idea to consider in this place. Um, that's how we try and use our experience. We also do some benchmarking in the UK. Um, what did we do here? Did it work? Did everybody like it? Did we get any complaints? Yes, no, it's a good or bad idea. These are a couple of things that we can do to um, try and make things easier on the ground. So I mentioned earlier that we feel like our clients are becoming more aware and I've got a good example of this. I was working with a, a UK customer quite recently, and we were specifying a raised arm barrier. And uh, the first question from the customer, is this barrier going to be PAS 68 rated? Which kind of took me by surprise, not because I didn't know what it was, but because I didn't think that this person would know what it was. Um, and it just goes to show that um, you know, our customers are becoming more educated on these, these kinds of things, and we're seeing a lot more in a way of government influence um, particularly in the UK, um, around data center design. And this can mean anything from building hardening or um, you know, impact testing, mail screening, and blast protection. These are kinds of things that are coming up quite regularly. And what's interesting about this in the UK specifically is this has led to the formation of a, a group called the CPNI, which is the Center for Protection of uh, the National Infrastructure. And what's even more interesting is this group was a, a merge of two uh, local security agencies or national security agencies, and it came together based on a threat to a data center. And nobody really knows how credible this particular threat was, but it was obviously enough for the UK government to think we need to start providing guidance um, around protecting data centers. So we feel like we're seeing um, you know, a stronger appetite, maybe, for high visibility, physical security. Um, I'm, asking, I'm, I'm asked questions regularly around things like anti-climb fencing, perimeter intrusion detection, and vehicle traps. Um, it's becoming more and more common. Uh, what we like to focus on, and again, Shane touched on this when he was talking about some of the challenges, is being involved at the right time. And um, for the same reasons that Shane mentioned, um, it's important to be involved in the design at the conceptual stage from a security standpoint. That's really our chance to um, you know, explore some of the ideas around crime prevention through environmental design, and that could be using, say, the landscape to influence our security designs, um, and designing in things like uh, redundancy and preventative measures into our security designs. And that could be concentric layers of physical security or diversity within our cabling infrastructure and redundant communication loops. But it's important to remember, um, you know, when you're doing this stuff internationally, that there are a magnitude of variant standards and things to consider um, that might affect, um, you know, the decisions you're making. What could be a complete given in the States may be absolutely alien uh, in, say, Europe or Asia. So. Okay. So this is an interesting one. Um, something that I'm seeing in the international market is security becoming... Um, you know, more and more involved in the sales process. And there's some good advantages for sales folks being able to confidently market what 
um, you know, data center oper operators are providing as fitting for that specific location. But on the flip side, um, you know, it's also important to remember that there's a cost to all these, these measures, and that's where the local knowledge and local expertise comes, comes into play. And I can give you an example, um, you know, maybe a vehicle trap. An end user may want to employ a vehicle trap. Um, you may want to consider manpower involved in operating a vehicle trap. And what does that cost in the US versus perhaps Hong Kong or somewhere else in, in Europe? And we know there's a large delta in the cost of labor. And that's where it does become important to um, sanitize your approach, um, use the local knowledge, um, and understand the value add before making these kinds of investments. Uh, so I'm nearly finished. I'm going to also share a short story with you. And Shane stole my thunder a bit with his. And I don't have a Portuguese accent, but <laughs> um, it's along the similar lines. And communication is probably the, the most important thing um, in all aspects throughout a design project when working abroad. Um, and my story starts in Tokyo, in Japan, where I was commissioning a uh, security system with a local vendor. We had a, a, a good relationship with them, and the, the lead guy there was a, an Australian, um, spoke fluent Japanese, and we were getting on fine, getting through the commissioning, um, until he said, I have to take off. This is my engineer. He's going to stay with you. And we soon realized that communication was going to be a big problem. We couldn't speak um, a word between us. A um, few hand gestures later, I figured the only option was Google Translate at this point. So here I am on my laptop. We're, we're at these points trying to test. And um, yeah, I'm typing in what I want him to do. And he's over my shoulder, kind of reading what I'm doing. And before I finish typing, yeah, yeah, no problem. He goes off and does it. I'm thinking, this is strange. You know, I haven't actually translated anything yet. But it turned out that this guy could read and write perfect English, but he just couldn't speak a word of it. So, yeah. <laughs> We got it done um, by any means possible, <laughs> and uh, that, that was my lesson learned. So, thank you very much. Back over to Pat. Had to find the right button. Um, so we've talked about how we get involved in the design process. Now we want to talk a little bit about how we've taken. U.S. models and, and adapted them as, as we've gone around the country. So we've worked with U.S. organizations, mostly corporate clients, uh, for 20 years. Uh, we've helped them develop their security standards, their operations. Uh, then we were asked to take their standards and operations and move, move them into the international market. They wanted the same consistency that they find here in the United States, only overseas. Uh, so we helped them uh, develop this process. and. The next thing that's evolved was now that we have all these assets, how do we actually monitor all the, all the systems that are happening uh, at these new facilities? So we've worked with them to come up with control room operations and evolve that control room operation into what is now uh, global security operation centers and global network operation centers. Uh, so a case study I do want to share with you um, revolves around Microsoft. This really changed how we do security operation centers for clients, for clients globally. Um, several years ago, Microsoft came to our group and said, you know, we have X amount of facilities, X amount of people and properties in these regions around the world. How do we put together a security operations plan that's actually going to protect these assets in all these different markets? Um, we didn't have any constraints as far as where the, you know, any, con any existing constraints and existing condition problems. We was a, it was a white paper, open platform, zero-based study that Sky was the limit. We could basically recommend anything we wanted to get them where they wanted to go. We put together some operational technical recommendations, gave them the white paper, and basically walked away. In 2007, we found that they actually implemented a global security operations center in three parts of the world, uh, having regional centers that could all, uh, uh, can all replace each other if something happens at one of them. They actually took our white paper and implemented it without our knowledge which was an amazing thing to go back and see how it actually was put, actually put into place. Um, what they did is they actually leveraged the Microsoft suite of products that they make and, dis and distribute. Um, they were able to optimize how these platforms all work together and basically put together a, a system using their own, their own technology. They realized that their clients really liked this strategy. 
they started giving tours of their global security operation centers and clients were saying, that's awesome. It's, it's, it's amazing what you've done with your suite of products. How do we get one? And then Microsoft had the challenge of how do we actually implement this? They don't install anything, so they had to find strategic partners to come and actually help them put together master planning and implementation strategies where we've gotten re-engaged with Microsoft to be their strategic partner to do this for them. In addition to being a strategic partner to work with Microsoft clients, we actually work uh, with Microsoft to, as a security design consultant to uh, put together the design for their cri uh, mission critical infrastructure around the world. So we, all, we work with their clients, and we also still work with Microsoft directly. So what we've done with this Global Security Operations Center, it's really become an all-hazards um, emergency preparedness program for their organization. Um, when we're talking about all hazards and we're talking about damage control and emergency preparedness, we try to figure out what other type of situation works similarly. The U.S. Navy obviously has to have excellent damage control processes when on, their, on their ships. Uh, there was a, a Navy vessel that was in the Persian Gulf in 1988. Uh, it hit in a, an Iranian mine. Uh, the mine caused an explosion, uh, flooded a few compartments within the ship, created a fire. They knew through their design processes that the, that the ship could withstand the, the blast um, and would be able to survive as long as only two compartments flooded. When they started putting the fire out, they started flooding a third compartment, which started to sink the ship. Um, but because they've had uh, excellent damage control process and they trained that process day in and day out and excellent leadership on the, on the ship, they were able to survive. They were able to, to patch the repairs and, 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 and live to fight another day, literally, in, in, in the wars. So when we take the damage control philosophy and try to implement that within a corporate structure, uh, we look at some of the basics, basic philosophies that surround the damage control process. Uh, they need to ensure the integrity of the vessel. In the corporate world, that's just making sure your, your facilities are operating and your corporate structure is, is sound. Uh, protect the lives uh, of all on board. And obviously, any corporation wants to make sure that their employees also stay healthy. Um, the damage control process must be fully documented. People must know what they're going to do and when they're going to need to do it based upon whatever the issue is. You've got to practice and drill it. You've got to know what your role is going to be if, if something, if an incident occurs, and it becomes part of your daily routine. In the Navy, they wake up and they do drills every day so that when something bad happens, they're able to respond to it. Same thing from a damage control standpoint within an organization. And then learning that everyone on board has a role. It's not just a security guy sitting at a reception desk that's going to be the response to fix the fire or fix the issue that's happening at a facility. So historically, we've always worked on, from a security standpoint, on reactive damage control. This is basically responding to information that comes in from the security technologies that are installed at a facility. It's finding out if we're damaged or not. So you're monitoring the systems that are available. Um, it's the figuring out whether you are damaged, and that's through monitoring the systems, or sorry, getting the reports from the systems to identify where, where, the, where the damage occurred. How bad's the damage? Basically, you do an assessment to figure it out. Um, how, do we, how, do we, uh, how do we repair the damage? Sorry. Uh, that's the, you get into a mitigation phase. Who do we have to tell within the organization that, that something has happened, which is your ex escalation process with, uh, um, um, sorry, your escalation process within the facility? And then basically, how do we do this better next time? You have to retain all this data document all the data so it's available so you can do a lessons learned exercise and learn from it in the, going, going forward. Now, how do we take that rear view approach and start looking forward? Um, in the Navy, they've got a radar so they can see the obstacles that are, that, are, that are in front of them to try and avoid them. We've started implementing global situational awareness in the security operations centers so that companies can know what's happening outside of their walls, what's happening in the region, what's happening in, in, their, in their neighborhood that's going to affect their facility. Identifying who the, who the enemy is. In the Navy, it's, it's, it used to be easy. They were in a, another ship coming at them. Uh, but they use intelligence to figure out what their, what their enemy is. We're now using information feeds that come through the network that let us know what the, what the situation might be that's happening outside our walls and how it's going to impact our facility. You want to find out where you can dock. You have to have a safe port to, to, to park in. 
Um, we use travel advisory systems that let us know where we can send employees if they have to get, get a, uh, evacuate a facility or evacuate a country. You want to know where your crew is. You have to know where your assets are. So we've used GPS integration to monitor where your assets are as a corporation around the world. And then basically, finally is how do we muster? What happens after the incident? How do we know everyone's okay and how do we survive? And that's through a mass notification system that gets implemented. So basically what we're trying to avoid is, is, is looking behind us at the, at the obstacles. We actually want to start looking in front of us and identifying the threats that are on the horizon so that we could try to avoid them before they actually occur. So the way that we've done this with the Security Operations Center is come through, see, it even works, uh, come through and, and start using the systems a little differently. In the security world, we have physical security information management. In the data center world, we now have data center information management. All these systems collect data and transfer the data to the client so they know what's happening with their systems in a real-time basis. We take that information and feed it into the operation center. We then take in inf information that's coming in from automated situational awareness uh, systems. This is information that's external to your client and external to your facility. Could be severe weather, could be some seismic activity, could be riots, you know, whatever the impact might be on your facility. But you have to monitor what's happening outside your walls. And then we also have the, the, the typical security response issues. We always, there, there are continual fire issues, medical issues. There could be a power, ser a power service issue, things that get phoned in to alert the security operations center what's going on. So all this gets monitored by operators within the operation center. And then when it, what's important now is to actually add on a toolkit that automatically changes and starts sending out information in response to the issue. So we start actually have, putting together engines for escalation and mitigation and retention. All these are automatic sy systems that automatically have a response based upon the issue. So it's actually a transition from sitting there watching the systems and monitoring the systems to find out what's happening to looking outside and having enterprise risk management involved. So this is instead of his looking back and seeing what's happening, what's happening with the system, this looking forward, finding out what the threats are that might be, not, could potentially come and harm the facility. So th through this, we do enterprise risk management and enterprise risk monitoring. And we do this both in the security and the network operation sector. So how does Microsoft get involved with this? They basically have a toolkit of systems and platforms that most corporations already have. Uh, these are off-the-shelf Microsoft products that most corporations are already bought into. They use InfoPath forms, which allows you to collect the data about your assets. We use SQL databases that provide for dynamic storage of this, of this data. We use SharePoint information so that the information can be gathered and shared and, and, and relayed in a real-time real format. And then we also incorporate some corporate travel advisory information so we know where our employees are and if they're in harm's way, we know where we can put them and they can be safe. And then we also have the RSS feeds that come in that let us know what the severe weather might be, if there's, if there's seismic activity, if there's traffic problems, you know, whatever Whatever the issue might be, we want to feed that information into the system, and all that's available through, through RSS feeds. And then the cool part of it is we put it together in a visual command center, so there's a graphic map that has a, a locate, your locations around the world, and you could identify on the map what the threats are as they approach your facility. So if there's a, if there's a, a cyclone or a hurricane heading towards your region, once it enters a certain space, you'll be alerted to it and know it's coming. So basically how this works in a real-time situation is you have an incident that's occurring somewhere around the world. That information uh, gets sent to the security operations center through the technology system. Real-time data is then transmitted to your security operator or your network operator so he knows the issue that's happening, what's happening, which, fa which facilities does this impact around the world, who's there and how are they impact, and then what do we do with it. So then through that technology stack, there's automatic business feeds that start initiating a response. What they do is they start notifying the people in harm's way of what the issue that's happening. You start escalating the process and letting your senior management know that the issue has occurred and these are the steps we're taking in to start, so they can start monitoring the situation. 
you continually monitor the, the, the event to make sure that you update folks of, of, the, of the status of the, of the issue. You communicate to the stakeholders what's going on, and then you document the, the, the information and retain the information into a toolkit that can be used for future learning. So this has really dramatically changed how security operators work globally. Uh, historically, a security guy sitting at a desk would be the one responsible for the security technology. Um, we've taken that and put it into an operations center where they're much more visible and they're much more involved into day-to-day -day operations of how the facility and it works in the global marketplace. So that concludes the, the operations center portion of the discussion, and I think we're a little sh we're good on time, so I don't know if you want to pick our brains a little bit about <coughs> things that we've seen around the world and uh, how we've dealt with them. Lane? Uh, have you guys had to maybe yield some of your security desires to make your AHA happy? You know, you're, you're trying to implement some security devices they won't let you install maybe in the locale. Is that something you see a lot of, or is it maybe less stringent than maybe U.S. I think it depends on the region. The question was, do we have to you know, give up some of our controls on our facilities and how we control facilities based upon local authorities having jurisdiction? Um, I know we like to work with the authorities to try and understand what their specific concern is and hopefully find a compromise. We do that here locally, uh, but internationally we, we have the same, same challenges. I found them to be less stringent. There you go. <laughs> we get away with more. Any other questions? Well, great. We appreciate your time. And uh, I do have some of the white papers that we mentioned for, for Microsoft. I do have a few copies that we brought with that I'll leave up here if someone wants to grab them um, while we're on a break. So thank you.